And this happens hmm. in 1704. And a lot of the big battles happen between 1704 and sort of 1711, 1712 sort of time. So it's a long, it's a fairly long, well, the war of Spanish succession lasts for 13, knocking 14 odd years long, it is. So it's not quick. There's but, many years of campaigning. Goes yeah, on. yeah. And but the, a lot of back and forth as well. Yeah. And I mean, again, we, you know, pre-modern era, so everything just takes longer anyway. You know, this is the mm. thing people have got to remember, you know, it's time. Everything is time. But anyway. Mm. Um, certain claimants die, other children are born in during those 13, 14 mm. years, so it changes the political map. Like at one point, an older brother dies and another one, someone else has a son, and it's like, oh, well, that completely changes our whole political calculation now. We need to flip sides, all sorts of stuff. You, you've, got, you've got to love the <laughs> politics of European monarchies mm. uh, and, and <laughs> aristocracies. It's just like, it's, it's, it is kind of arbitrary. <laughs> <laughs> But the point is, yeah. I suppose, that there's just like a giant, giant, the biggest struggle yes. is between Charles of Austria, the Holy Roman Emperor, and Louis XIV. Mm -hmm. And uh, we come down on the side against Louis. Because even before this period where we'd had the King William of Orange, William III, he was sort of implacably against Louis XIV his mm -hmm. whole life. So we, we're just a continuation of that. By mm -hmm. this point, uh, Mary dies just before, a few years before, uh, William of Orange. William of Orange dies in a hunting accident, falls off his horse. Mm. Quite common to sort of just fall off your horse. Yep. Um, and die. And so it goes to Mary's younger sister, Anne. Anne's best friend, quite literally her best mate, uh, was a Sarah Churchill, whose husband is John Churchill. Right. Whose father was a Winston Churchill, instantly. And whose like great, 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 great grandson is, of course, another Winston Churchill. He was born in Blenheim Palace. Which you know was, yeah, which was built. Yeah. Uh, I did know that because I've been there. Oh, right, and yeah. of course, it's got Winston Churchill's bedroom still in it. Right. Uh, but it was built with the um, the rewards that he got following the Battle of Blenheim. Mm, mm. Yeah, I'll detail a little bit of that right at the very end, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. Um, so let's just dive straight Spoiler into it. Spoiler alert, we win. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we win this one. Um, so John Churchill, later to become the first Duke of Marlborough, yeah. um, was just a career, I mean, his family, they were sort of, well to do but not ennobled hmm. um and he was a career military man mm -hmm. and uh he was sort of in the entourage in the household of james james the second so the younger brother of charles the second and james had raised him to be well a, a general in the army hmm. but then during the glorious revolution uh, it's one of the stains you could argue on Churchill, john churchill's record is that he sort of sees the ways way the wind is blowing and switch sides over to William. Right. Well, he's not, again, John Churchill isn't, um, Duke of Marlborough isn't a Catholic, so it sort of made sense. But he did, you can't really deny, sort of backstabbed his benefactor there at that moment in time. Yeah. Some people say, oh, that's a dark black, black mark on him. And others say, no, it's the right thing to do. It's yeah. absolutely the right thing to do. He was well following done. his principles. All right. Yeah. Oh, right. I tend to believe that. As a non-Catholic Englishman, I tend to believe. <laughs> <laughs> Weirdly, I think he's on the right side of history. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so it turns out that he, like I say, he was sort of a, a, a captain general. You can't yeah. get much higher than that. A captain general of the British Army. Um, and his wife, they were like a double act, a political double act. Mm. Um, his wife, once Anne becomes queen, it's, she couldn't be closer to the, yeah. to the, to the throne. And so he gets... He's sort of promoted. He couldn't be promoted any higher. Mm. If there's going to be a big campaign on the continent, he's, he, the man. he's going to get it. Yeah. He's going to get the command of it. Um, so by 1704, um, it's, there's a coalition, an allied coalition, um, and it looks like, well, Bavaria in, in modern southern Germany. There's no Germany yet still. Yeah. Uh, Bavaria in southern Germany. Um, is on the side of Louis. Now that is sort of, a, well, he flipped. Originally he was on our side and he right. flipped. And, is Bavaria Catholic? Um, I Probably is. I don't know if he was. I suppose he, I, I should know that, but I'm not sure, hmm. actually. Um, but he flipped sides. Right. And that was a big sort of realignment there because what that means is now you've got aren't like Bavaria had an army of sort of 45,000 men mm. and it allows the French combined French armies to march through to potentially 
besiege and take Vienna. Hmm. Now, if Vienna was taken, that would spell the end of our coalition. Well, take, and we taking, would be left sort of on our own against the rest yeah. of Europe. Well, they would have taken our allies' capital, knocking them out of the war. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, so we had an army in the United Provinces. We talked a little bit, didn't we, about mm. the United Provinces, modern-day Holland, basically. Yeah. Um, and there was a, 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 a big sort of meeting there about what to do. Mm. Now Bavaria's just sort of flipped. Uh, what are we going to do? And the, the, the Dutch and a, a big faction in our, in our politics thought, well, we'll just, we'll just have a campaign into France. Sort of either go down into what is modern-day Belgium and northern France or, or sort of skirt around the Moselle River, go down to sort of the Alsace-Lorraine region mm. and sort of cut in to the heart of France that way, mm. basically try and stab France in some sort of way. Do something. We've got to do something, yeah. right? Um, so that's sort of, I suppose, where the story begins, where the campaign of right, 1704 okay. begins. Um, I've got a quick paragraph here from Charles O'Man. Wouldn't be an epoch without an O-Man quote. Just before you go on uh, to the quote, th yeah. this this strikes me as a relatively um, ill-defined set of campaign goals. Like, right, so Bavaria's just flipped. Okay, well, what's our plan? Attack France? And do what? With what goal? What, we can take Paris? Mm. You know, what we can do is just, just ravage the countryside a bit, because, I mean, it's not like we haven't done that before. You know, uh, just what was the plan? If it's just literally just going to take 50,000 men down there and see what happens. Uh, okay. Well, you make a good point, and what comes up here is uh, Churchill, um, he's, he has got a plan. Right. He sort of makes out that he hasn't necessarily got very, very clearly defined war goals, but he actually has. Okay. But you make a great point. Why doesn't he, well, and, I suppose um, he doesn't tell people to make sure the plan doesn't leak or something. And, right, yeah. yeah. And also, that is a problem even into the 21st century. Oh, yeah. Remember when the Americans went into Iraq without really any yeah. defined concrete war yeah. goals? Same with Afghanistan. We'll just change the regime. Yeah, then what? Uh, yeah. It's not how it works. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> like, you better have a plan. We'll figure it out. Yeah. We'll do it live. Don't worry yeah, about yeah, it. Yeah. We'll do it live. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Um, so, so Winston Churchill said of Louis, this is quite a damning thing. He said, quote, No worse enemy of human freedom has ever appeared in the trappings of polite society. <laughs> oh, sorry, polite civilization. He, he had an insatiable appetite, cold, calculating ruthless, ruthlessness, a monumental conceit, uh, presented themselves armed with fire and sword. Like me. That's what the, the, the 20th century Winston Churchill thought mm. about Not uh, Louis XIV. Mm. Yeah, he does. He, I don't know about megalomaniac because he wasn't mad. He did have designs. He, did, he was ambitious. He did want to sort of control all of Europe. I don't or think the world that, even. I don't think being mad is a necessary component of megalomania, to be honest. Yeah. I think it's just lust for power. Mm. Yeah. I think once you've got a great deal of money and power, the only thing left to aim at, if you don't want to just take it easy for the rest of your days, is to accrue more of it. There's nothing else to do, is there? Glory. Yeah. That's, right. what, that's what you need next. Right. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Make sure your name is stamped more firmly in the in the history books. Yeah. What else is there to do? Um, but Sir Charles O'Man says, and um, this is sort of a general thing about John Churchill, Duke of Marlborough. Hmm. Um, he said, quote, Hitherto Churchill had shown himself an able general, but, uh, uh, but no one had taken the true measure of his abilities or recognised the fact that he was by far the greatest military man that England had ever known. But now the ignominious political antecedents of Queen Anne's favourite were about to be hidden from view by the laurels that he was to win. John Churchill, when once he had been in, it, when, when once he had intrigued his way to power, showed that he was well fitted to hold it. As a soldier, he was the founder of a new school of scientific strategy. On the battlefield, he was alert and vigorous, but he was greater in the operations that precede a battle, because his men. His nickname was Corporal John because they sort of loved him so much. He was right. like he was like a corporal to them. He looked yeah. out for his men, looked out for the individual men yeah. as a corporal might. Right. Um, so that was one of his one of his nicknames, Corporal John. Um, he had an unrivaled talent for careful and scientific combinations by which he would deceive and circumvent an enemy so as to attack him when least expected and at the greatest, greatest advantage. A bit Napoleon, mm. Napoleonic-esque in that sense. He does do things that Napoleon would do. Yeah. 
um, uh, where generals of an older school would run headlong into a fight and win with heavy loss. He would outflank or outmarch his enemy and hustle him out of his positions with little or no bloodshed. On one occasion, as we shall see, which I won't, we won't go into, but on one occasion, he drove an army of 60,000 French before him and seized half the Duchy of Brabant without losing more than 80 men. Blimey. Yet when hard blows were necessary, he never shrank from the most formidable problems and would lead his troops into the hottest fire with a cool-headed courage that won every man's admiration. He sounds great. It's a soldier, soldier. Mm. And he has that thing, which Napoleon definitely didn't have, where he put a great deal of emphasis on making sure his men had boots <laughs> and enough food. Yeah, and Napoleon's and busy spending 20,000 lives a month. John Churchill isn't. Napoleon always said, even when it obviously wasn't going to work, he said, oh, well, the army can just live off its own means. They can just plunder whatever they need at all times. I don't really need to worry about logistics too much. That's yeah, crazy. And, 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 and like the vittles for their horses and things. It will just sort itself out. Yeah, it's mental. Yeah, maybe sometimes in summer in the right parts of Europe, but yeah. well, a lot yeah. of the time not. That's not going to work yeah, for Especially you. not if it's getting late in the year in Russia, for example. All right, yeah. But there, there's a, I can't remember who said it, but there's a famous quote, it's, luck is the residue of design. Mm. And that's mm. what I'm hearing from John Churchill. Yeah. There's a man who's, who spends a lot of time carefully planning mm. everything before the action, and then the action goes swimmingly because everything has been accounted for in advance. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Oh, absolutely right. Um, so there's this. So he's he mar he says to the Dutch mm. and the United Provinces, who are our first ally, yeah. really says, you know, we've got to do something here. Otherwise, Louis is just gonna they're gonna march on Vienna and take it. Yeah. Um, well, we we need to strike a blow. And the Dutch are sort of like oh. they do that loads in in this war. Actually, they're right. like, oh, we've only got one small army and we don't want to risk it. And uh. and so he basically says, okay. Well, I'm going to do what I'm going to do. You're invited to come along if you want, but I'm just going to do what's in England's best interest right now. Yeah. And they sort of go, okay, and they give him a few battalions. Right. They're sort of fairly, yeah, so that's what happens. So he starts marching down um, down the, the Moselle River hmm. as, in, as though he's going to attack into the Alsace-Lorraine region. But it's, it's just to cut to the chase on it, it's a giant feint. That's not what he does. But it's sort of kept, it keeps the secret so well mm. that everyone's fooled by it. Um, I've got one account here from a, a Captain Parker of the Royal Irish Regiment, um, who's obviously there. Mm. And he said, quote, Now, as we expected to march up the Moselle, to our surprise, we crossed that river over a stone bridge and the Rhine over two bridges of boats. And we proceeded on our march through the country of Hescassel, where we were joined by the troops of the hereditary prince, which made our army 40,000 fighting men complete. Um, and so he's doing sort of this giant feint, basically, mm -hmm. and the French army sort of mirror him. Um, they're, they're absolutely expecting him to sort of, at any moment, sort of recross the Moselle and go straight into the heart of France, maybe even, you know, somewhere around Verdun, somewhere like that. Um, and he even... Marlborough even uh, starts building bridges as right. though he's going to do that. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but what he's done, one of the great things he, he does is this idea of logistics to make sure that if the men have got enough food and horses have got enough food and they've got boots, they can do things that during that day seemed impossible. Mm. Like you can't march 40,000 men 250, 260 miles in six weeks, and at the end of it, they're as fresh as daisies and can fight a battle. You can't do that. Not normally, anyway. Well, that's exactly what he does, essentially, because he just does it well. Um, I tell you, it must have been good to, you know, if you're going to be a soldier in anyone's army, thank God you got him, because, like, there are so many generals who just don't care about you at all. Good old Corporal John will look yeah. after you. You see, that's yeah. why they... they but, uh, but I tell you what, man, we've talked about this before, and I'm, I'm telling you, man, the, this unwavering belief that our general is not only the best, but he also is looking out for us. Mm. That's the mm. that's the secret source for a, a, a general, for, a, for a, 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 a massively successful army every yeah. time. Because you know? quite often you need the goodwill of your fighting men. Yeah. Certainly. Well, it's, they're the ones doing the fighting. Right, yeah. If they don't believe that they can win or they're going to win or that you're looking out for them, then they're going to fight poorly. To watch the full video, please become a premium member at lotuseaters.com.